てコントローラーを操作するだけただし場所によってトラップのコードがグリーンイエローブルーなどというように変化しているので要注意またマージン家の人々はこのどうも。Viewers to drop in, maybe or maybe not, <laughs> because、uh, yeah, today was a little bit、uh, the announcement to the stream was a little bit on the uh, very uh, yeah, short side, short sighted. I don't know the correct term, but yeah, I, I, I spent、uh, most of the day、um, with my wife and we were having coffee. And then we even decided to go, hey, weather is beautiful, why not let's go for a hike? And this is what we did, and we just returned. So this is why this stream started almost on time, but not quite. And I completely forgot to keep you in the loop in terms of、uh, what's going to be today's stream,、um, when is going to be、uh, today's stream, or more. In, in more、uh, definitive terms, what today's stream is going to be about. So, yeah, it's about texturing, it's about modeling and shading. And、um, just、uh, give, to give you a little wrap up of、uh, the things that are currently、uh, cooking with me, for one thing, it's the Ludum Dara 46 post mortem. Uh, I recorded the voiceover and managed to、uh, get, lull myself to sleep by cleaning my own voiceover.、Uh, yeah, when I did this, I had a long day and I just fell asleep trying to clean the voiceover. So, this is not done yet, so、uh, the edit hasn't started. But in the meantime, man, it was just a, such a joy to、uh, work with Unity and do some game dev and yet、yeah, really trying to warm up with Unity and see how things、uh, go with it. Again,、uh, I said I'm pretty new to object oriented programming. Um, while not 
that new in, in principle, but more new to the actual implementation, actual stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, of, of yeah doing things and more that is just a little test object and then another class that's derived from this one test object and so on and so forth. So far, everything that I've set out to do works mostly and this is a very uh, big part of my motivation is that hey let's try this can i get this to work and then i just set aside a couple of hours and then i manage to get it to work and this motivates me enough to keep going and add more little stuff um, in the last stream i showed you what i got in the works and how it should play out and yeah it's it's at its heart it's a adventure game it's played from the first person where you just explore scenes do some little adventure thingy stuff like pick up this object examine it use it there find some more clues and progress the story and in between those are fmv full motion video sequences where you can maybe uh, change the dialogue uh, on, on one line or yeah just just try to interact a little bit more with uh, the character so yeah this is let me switch over to the what's on the screen and yes this is the little test scene i hope it works or it updates now in obs because last time when i was zoomed in i realized that um, everything went to a crawl and it was not so much of a slideshow of me and the game it was more like still pictures when i tried to run it at 4k and also have obs encode the video stream so yeah this is little demo scene that i have here set up in unity um, with one little object that I added uh, over the course of this week. Um, for those who watched last time, they saw probably already this model here, but now it's it's wonderfully shaded and I'm very happy with uh, how shading and, and texturing worked. And I will show you the tools that I use to get this uh, to work and yeah, probably just see, yeah, see how far we can go with something else that I want to add to this little demo scene so yeah you can see i have more uh, of a free form approach to making video games um well of, of course i have an idea and a rough concept of what i want to do but essentially since i'm a solo dev uh, i divide my time between huh does it feel today more like a coding day or is today more a day where i think yeah it's i to just take it leisurely and just do some cleanups or things on the code where i'm just yeah refactoring and trying to make things more um yeah faster to iterate and so on and and just yeah error checks <laughs> and so on in case that i should forget something because at this point everything is in flow also in terms of which objects interact with which others and so on and so forth and then maybe i got some days where i feel like yeah i really want to do some texturing and make things look nice and then there are days where i think Think, yeah let's let's add some new functionality and of course there are days where pretty much all of those things happen in different uh, different uh, weights if to put a programmer term <laughs> where I, it's like two quarters I'm more interested in coding but then I realize the last quarter is or the last yeah one quarter is coding two quarters of coding one quarter is cleaning up the code and then the other quarter is uh yeah maybe let's do a texture before going to bed and then i spend until the morning hours and beyond those just to make something look nice yeah in terms of of making things look nice let's switch over to the game view and i will have a, an eye here on obs and see if it's still updating in an okay fashion yes it does so um what i added from last time as well apart from the shading and texturing on this little desk here is when you press f you get a little flashlight and the cool thing about the flashlight is that when you point it uh, at something or yeah you your middle point the center of the screen um, you point at something the flashlight automatically tries to uh, look at this point that you're focusing so uh, usually i would have just have an object the flashlight that was oriented or parented on the player object and it would just point straight ahead and i thought especially when you're close up on something you really want to illuminate what's close and this is what this does and then i realized hmm, it would have been even better if you can point the mouse somewhere and it have it follow around and this is what i implemented next so if you right click 
then move the mouse, you can also move the flashlight. And this I found very helpful, <laughs> especially, like I said, since this is a detective game and you really want to, yeah, um, to examine stuff, to look at stuff, to, to investigate, and this is why it's really helpful to, to guide your gaze. And also what I personally to me is when you're looking at things or trying to interact with something and then you all you can do is move the camera and it gets really janky so this is why i implemented this right click and then you get the mouse mouse pointer and can interact with anything you can still move around and then you right click again to have the mouse as a mouse look i'm not quite sure about this uh if to keep it in the end but so far i i, I really like it and so this is why it stays in oh yeah and this is the other new thing is when you hit I, you got this little inventory screen there. Now, right now it says contents nothing. And when I click this one here, and now it's here part of this very badly laid out uh, inventory screen. Right now it's just uh, to get the functionality in there and not about looking it, uh, having it look nice. So right now it's just a string that adds a plus sign and a line break each time you pick something up. So just to have it work, and this is yeah, currently the state of my game. And with shift, uh, holding down shift, you can run, which is also very helpful. Yeah, this is uh, how it's currently looking. And I thought I wanted to work a little bit more here on this level design of this yeah, warehouse section there. So um, this is why I imported or exported uh, the entire scene from Unity to Maya. Um, how did I do this? This might be interesting to you. I got a package here. Where is it? Window export to Maya. And it is this one here. Uh, you can see it's Maya version. The latest version is 2016. So I bought this uh, tool actually for um, Headroom, the Ludum Dara game that I made with Max together. And I bought this yeah, just to be able to do some very quick block block out, block sketching in Unity, and then transport everything over to Maya and have it the scene pretty much set up. And when I add something to this scene in inside Maya and export it from there, everything matches up in Unity, the position, the scale, and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, the only downside is this was not free. I think I paid, I don't know how much money I paid for it, but yeah, either way, um, it, it was not free, but I think there should be now functionality in Unity to export the scene or at least some geometry to your preferred rendering and modeling package. For me, it is Maya because I'm feeling rich. <laughs> no, sadly, it's Maya because um, I used uh, Maya during all my college years before I was a Max guy and the first year in college where we really had to use Maya. I did everything in Studio Max and then imported it into Maya until it was really obvious and I thought I really need to get started with Maya. And then for many years Maya became my number one go-to and with uh, Blender while I tried it, um, yeah, I don't feel uh, right now currently um, motivated to invest a lot of time to get uh, to a point where I'm with Maya right now where everything feels pretty natural and intuitive. Uh, granted Maya is anything but intuitive but uh, yeah if you grind yourself against its inconsistencies long enough you really feel like yeah this this makes sense this does make sense. And uh, activity in the chat here so apparently people are watching. Thank you so much. Mother Sheep says hello Phil how are you doing? Doing fine. How about you? And Sorcerer says just dropping to say hi but I will watch the what tomorrow night. Thank you so much for dropping by and have a great evening and when you watch this, hi again. Um, this is me greeting you on demand this time. Uh, yeah, thank you for dropping by. So, um, where were we? Yeah, right. I exported the scene to Maya. The cool thing about this plugin is that it keeps all your hierarchy as it is and it even exports um, light sources and so on. As In this case, as spotlights, they really are spotlights also in Maya. Mothership is doing well. This is great. So you know what? I forgot to mention that each time I say the word with you and uh, that ends with Nikorn, we all have a sip of water because it's good, fun and healthy to stay hydrated, especially during the summer heat. My God, it's so hot again. But then again, this is me all times all the time complaining in the summer it's too hot for me in the winter of course it's too cold and in between it's like yeah it's this transitioning time i don't like it either so yeah i'm a grumpy old guy <laughs> sorry for that 
Mothership said it's way too hot. Yeah, please, please all drink water uh, if you can, because water is the best. But then again, I'm the person who enjoys his water by having it go through the whole process of running through an espresso machine and then coming out at the end. So this is also how I get my water. Um, right. So uh, yeah, I have this architecture here, as you can see there. It's it's. I mean, it's it got baked light maps because. I'm a sucker for baking light maps and having everything look nice and, and wonderful. This, my god, this is really a problem with me. I was playing um, uh, the Chimera Squad game recently. Let me just show it to you uh, on Steam if you haven't played it or don't know what I'm talking about. Um, it's the XCOM, the new XCOM game. It's, it's more like XCOM 2.5. And the thing is, man, there are so many little things that annoy the crap out of me that nobody else seems, seems to notice or not many people really care about. And the things are, yeah, there's just some weird clipping going on. Sometimes you're looking from inside a character to another just to have this dynamic camera work. And then there are contact shadows aren't working or something is inside the fire, but it gets... Uh, uh, you can really see where the fire particle effects are cut out against the silhouette of uh, of one of the game characters and so on. Yeah, it's it's fine. Actually, it's it's really fine. But, but like I said, to me, it's it's a mess, and this is what I want to try to avoid. Yeah, this is Chimera Squad. For those uh, if you haven't played it, I played it apparently two hours, and yesterday at uh, night I had to rage quit because man, there is this one mission. I won't go into details, but. The, Apparently, I, I, I am right now. But yeah, there is this one mission that, that just made me quit the game entirely. Uh, Mothership says, what is the prototype uh, going to be about? Is it about uh, going to be a game? Yes, actually, it's supposed to be a game. Uh, just a quick uh, rundown on what I have and one I, what I plan to do. Um, this game is supposed to be uh, my take on a mix between um, the Tex Murphy FMV games and a little bit of LA Noir in terms of, yeah, this is just the setting that I've more or less uh, decided upon when I was working on my Ludum Dara 42 game, uh, uh, the video, uh, and I just uh, took a scene from, from my uh, script from 42 and just tried to make it a little bit more interactive, just spitballing ideas around for an FMV game. And then I had some time last week, or while well, it wasn't last week, it was like three or yeah, three weeks ago. And I just shot this here in my home office, just trying to get a quick video sequence going. And it worked. And I coded up uh, in Unity, yeah, this little prototype where you can uh, yeah, decide upon which video is going to play next and have a little text string and so on and it it worked out quite well and I thought hmm, maybe I should keep working on that and then I outlined more or less just this one little scene that could be also part of my post-mortem <laughs> um, but in, in this little scene that's, that's being played out here is essentially um, you drop in uh, to this warehouse manager at night because you know that he knows something but he is not really willing to tell you anything and he just boots you from his office and now you are in front of his office in this part here of this warehouse and you need to dig up dirt on him and yeah this is what this scene essentially is supposed to be about where you just examine everything and there's some voiceover going on when you examine stuff and try things out then you find some clues there in the waste paper paper bin that's supposed to be this one and maybe find a key inside um, this uh, desk and so on and so forth and then you happen to uh, to stumble upon a secret room in which you find incriminating evidence and with that you can return to this guy and advance the story and it's actually it's just supposed to be this little prototype slash vertical slice of something and I really want to get this relatively rock solid and see if I can pull it off to have it yeah just the whole package to have it look nice to make the interactions possible and to not kill myself trying to code everything so this is why it's mostly based around scriptable objects and all the controller objects know how to handle scriptable objects and the game flow is in those man I hope this wasn't too verbose um, Mothership says, um, sounds interesting, so fixed camera with choices interaction, like a point and click adventure. Yeah, it's, well, I can show you again the beginning. Um, let me, it's, it's uh, video scenes in between. 
Um, let me find my scene manager and there I have to say next video scene because if the next scene is none, then it won't play a scene. But if I say warehouse one, the prototype should start with the scene. There we go. Ernest inspiration was my only lead. So I'm not quite sure if you can hear it, but yeah, ability. it's just some voiceover. By force, if necessary. And we get, of course, the camera warning because I deactivated all the cameras. Ernest inspiration. Jesus, pigs! How the hell did you get in here? And now we can select um, our uh, reply on how did we get in here. And in the meantime, this idle uh, animation is here playing with just cutting back and forth. It's just a looping video. And yeah, do you want? Uh, do we want to go with understatement or the problematic doorman or gumshoe bravado? I think this was the last uh, time that we picked. Uh, so let's try. Let's go. How did we get in here? Well, the problematic doorman. The doorman let me in. Once I told him I was a big admirer of you. Nice fella. It dim though. Jimmy! No ice cream for you, you hear me? You big dunce! Make it quick. I just came to ask you a question. Then come back tomorrow, I'm not in the mood. Yeah, and so, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, let's say doubtful. Middle of the night? Come on, inspiration. We don't have to do this. Yeah, and then we are here in this uh, warehouse level and for, for now, for this prototype, we just need to pick up the magical MacGuffin, which sets a flag in the game control and then when we return, it plays the ending animation. It, it, if we return without it, then it plays one of the random animations where we just get booted out again uh, with a different dialogue. So this is essentially what is there. The cool thing about this uh, FMB uh, flow control in terms of programming is that it works. It just works. And if I want to make an entire game that's just based around FMV, all I need to do is uh, use a bunch of scriptable objects. For example, here, the scene with the warehouse, it just adds asks for the starting clip. And the starting clip says here, start. And then it says it is, it is a choice point. And yeah, those are the three choices you have. And each choice has another video clip SO associated with it. And from this on, you really can build an entire flow uh, of, of, yeah, of operations of how the game should flow. It's a bit painful to do this uh, this way, where you just have uh, not really some kind of flow chart like in Twine. But um, I did uh, the game design for this part in Twine and this worked very well. And then I just named all those little videos here, those sections, like I had my uh, sections named in Twine and also used the Twine. Essentially, the Twine was just an interactive uh, screenplay. <laughs> uh, and this is this really this is how it worked. It, it's just painful to set it up. But once you have it, uh, my my scripts just process those uh, uh, objects, the scriptable objects and the flow that goes on in them. And that's about it. And uh, that's very cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, again, I hope I, I want, like I said, I want to make it a bit. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you. I didn't say the joke, but yeah, now it's coming. I want to make it unintentionally cheesy because since I'm doing all the acting, at least so far, it's going to be bad. And this is, I mean, this is a staple of the FMV games <laughs> that uh, their acting is a bit, uh, either it's, it's, it's really horrible or it's way too much over the top and uh, everyone is just chewing scenery. And then it's also a bit fun to see, oh my God, uh, is this getting even worse in terms of how obnoxious this is. So, um, right. But again, uh, in the in the between sections where you have to do those investigations, I want this first person, um, yeah, detective game essentially. Uh, I don't want any kind of characters because for the life of me, I can't do characters, neither animate them, nor model them, nor rig them, nor anything. I mean, maybe animating I could, but uh, probably it would take me way too long for for the result. So this is why you get more or less static scenes where it just yeah get some puzzles maybe inventory combination puzzles um so far i don't have a lot of design just just for this bit here where you have to uh, interact with an old timey fuse box and 
you know me, I love my research. I researched extensively how in the 1940s fuse boxes looked like and how they worked mostly. So uh, like I said in the last stream, I'm very much looking forward to modeling all these intricate cables there where it just uh, pop in a mains block fuse, uh, 55 amperes or maybe 50, I think it was 50. Yeah, either way, uh, I spent much too, too much time with research, but I'm very much looking forward to just, yeah, get, get the look right. And yeah, this little uh, desk here, this was my starting point in terms of lighting and shading and texturing. And I'm very happy with how this turned out. And I thought, yeah, let's, let's just continue with more stuff. So um, this was Unity. Um, uh, Mother Sheep says, but I definitely like the concept. Thank you. Yeah, again, it's it's just a prototype, uh, so I, I won't make any promises how, how good it will be in the end, but it's more or less a learning experience for me. And because the scope is so small, it's, it's really fun and it's not too overwhelming. Like I had this one idea a couple of years back where I wanted to make a moon rover game, but it was like an open world and you had different factions on the moon and it was more like hard sci-fi. So I researched a lot into in situ resource uh, 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 extraction and stuff and it was just too much. And all these intricate systems of the moon rover where it had uh, CO2 levels and heat and it was powered by solar, yeah, it was just too big and this is why I lost interest pretty pretty soon after, but not after starting an extensive media wiki, just trying to wrap everything <laughs> so that I could work with it, but it yeah, didn't work out. But this one is small enough that I feel like I can do things and pull it off. So um, where is Maya? Close it again, there we go. I just want to show you um, the scene um, warehouse, side wall, warehouse, brick wall, scene layout. There we go. This is an updated version, a more uh, uh, yeah, laid out version of how I want this scene to look like. Now we are inside Maya. So you can see it looks pretty similar, but it got, it got more details to it. For one thing is, you can see here there is... Um, these parts here are closed off. Um, those are supposed to be just some... some uh, uh, yeah. Well, it's not bricks, it's uh, wood planks. There we go, that's the word. Th those are wood planks and there are two doors there. One you can open with the right key because again, this is an adventure game. So this door you should be able to open and then I can animate this. And inside this compartment that we just opened, you can find here on the wall this uh, fuse box that you need to to interact with. So yeah, this is just again a door to have an obstacle in the way for the player to overcome. Again, this is not, the modeling is not final, but I, so far the dimensions of those things are so that I just know how how big I need to do them and so on and so forth. Because it's always hard when you're working in this abstract 3D space and you really need a reference for how big a person is in comparison so that it doesn't feel a little bit off in games because I have some th sometimes I have this problem that it feels like I think in the new Resident Evil it was like yeah the cars look a little bit too big compared to the player characters and it just you can't really tell it's maybe like 10% too big or something 10% too small and you you can't quite tell it and this is why I want really to make sure to use real world measurements and yeah, again, this is a wonderful uh, rabbit hole for me to go down, especially when you want to have something like this thing here. This should be part uh, of, of a wall segment. There are just those uh, uh, huge windows there. And just let me duplicate it so you know how it's supposed to look like. So there are three of those window segments. And this one here is uh, blocked with bricks because again, we need this uh, fuse box here. And yeah, uh, and since this is brick uh, work, I thought maybe I should real uh, research how large an actual brick is. Turns out there are a number of different brick sizes that are used all over the world at different times. So I had to find the right brick size for this building that was supposed to be constructed sometime in the late 1800s, early, early uh, 19th, uh, yeah, 1910, 1900. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, and 
and it went uh, uh, downhill from there. So yeah, this is why I, I really love my research. And Mothership writes in the chat, uh, do you, how do you texture these models? And yes, scale is difficult. Yeah, this is exactly the thing, how, how we texture something. Um, to, for example, uh, let's turn our attention to Unity and hope my GPU is, is keeping up with it. For, for, yeah, for this little desk here, I have a small old, uh, well, it's more of a side table. Actually, I have it here behind me. Um, I'm not sure if I can show you, show it to you, but you know what? Let's try this the good old way. I make a photo right now and show you the picture. <laughs> let's hope this works. Uh, and uh, there we go. Apparently it's not looking too good. So yeah, it's it's this red blob thing here. This is this little side table. Yeah, and I just took it out and uh, photographed it from from all different angles and used uh, these uh, uh, photographs there as a reference. I have, frankly, I almost uh, anticipated that I would use uh, these uh, photos sooner or later in the stream. So this is why I have them here. Uh, let's just like, let me quickly show you how these photos look like. Yeah, this is the table. And this is the drawer of the table and so on. I just tried to get the lighting pretty uh, soft and then that I could use. Oh yeah, this is a reference here for the specularity where I just positioned the light differently that you would see mostly the reflection. In the end, I didn't use this, but it's nice to have just a reference for yourself. What is reflective and what is not. And yeah, just the different sides of the drawer, inside, outside, and the biggest, yeah, this is already stretched uh, that it works as a square. And this is the underside because you never can have too many different variations of, of wood. <laughs> so um, yeah, and with those, I just went uh, straight to Photoshop. Of course, um, what one thing that is often overlooked is proper UV texturing or setting UVs. Um, for those who don't know, UVs are texture coordinates. This is how uh, texture is laid out on the object. For example, we have here uh, this cube here. And this is its UV map, uh, since this is not very interesting, <laughs> since it comes from, from Unity, I think. Yeah, this, for example, this one here is a Maya cube that I just stretched. And you can see here, this is the UV map. This is just an unwrapped cube. But of course, because it's it's still um, yeah a cube and not a, a very elongated rectangle, everything there gets harshly stretched there. So this those things here are actually supposed to say this one V <laughs> one. So if I move now those UVs around here, you can see how it changes there on on the texture itself. And yeah, this UV mapping is something that uh, is often overlooked. I've realized uh, sometimes when I buy models, and yes, I, I've, I've come to the point in my life where I buy 3D models. Um, I see many people were pretty sloppy when it, when it comes to uh, setting up UVs and others roll their pretty uh, own obscure systems. Um, for example, with the PlayStation 2 uh, model that I bought, uh, you would assume that it's everything is just yeah probably uv mapped and there's one texture for the entire thing this is not how it went everything had shaders and only very specific parts where you would have a label or a text that says on or sony or p or one <laughs> or anything um, this would be a very tightly mapped area and the rest wouldn't be mapped so it was just a nightmare to to tweak <laughs> And Commander Stitch says he's live, and I say thank you so much for dropping by, Commander. Welcome back, Commander. I played XCOM so <laughs> recently, so um, right. So yeah, this is pretty much uh, the layout how I wanted to to be here since this is an old-timey warehouse again. And um, so I started with this wall segment here. Again, it's supposed to be a brick wall. And I let me open a previous scene on this, the warehouse brick section A. And let's open, yeah, version 08. And if you follow me on Twitter, you might have seen my tweet that I said, um, yeah, everyone is using normal maps. Maybe I should also use normal maps because you can see here I built the entire thing of actual cubes that are in sizes of bricks. And you know what's the worst part about this is? 
that it doesn't entirely work because I made some uh, architectural uh, screw-ups. <laughs> For example, in this row here, this column here should not rest exactly on this brick here on the bottom. Um, I can't select it individually now. <laughs> but yeah, this one should, should be uh, offset by half so that this this brick here rests on uh, the lower one and not here in, on this edge and so on and so forth. And this also made a problem here because uh, I realized that I wanted original or actual brick sizes a little bit too late. And here on top, let me switch over to wireframe, you might see that those here uh, are spaced a little bit differently than those here because actually um, they don't really match up. So it's it's half a brick too short or half a brick too long, uh, the size of this window. No one will notice unless you're a diehard architecture uh, a nerd, <laughs> probably. But yeah, these are uh, things that drive me crazy. Yeah, and I thought, um, yeah, maybe maybe I shouldn't do it like this, but at least I get now a good reference to do some uh, normal baking so that I can use this high definition map uh, or high definition model how many polygons it has 15700 triangles this entire thing here so it's not it's yeah it's re it's really something <laughs> and i thought i just bake it to a normal map and then don't have to worry about uh, yeah texture sizes or at least a triangle count but then i realized yeah um with my game i really want uh, your you're the detective and you can yeah, uh, investigate and you have to go close to, to certain things. And so I thought, yeah, maybe I should should keep some of those models in, especially at, at the size where you would be looking at, at eye level, essentially. And uh, this is what I came up with in the end. Um, so you can see here, it's only modeled uh, till a certain height. And from there on, it's just, a, I think I could get away with just a normal map up there. But again, the problem was that everything needed to be mapped. And this is what I spent a good chunk of the evening that day with um, just doing here uh, the UV map. Let me just quickly show you how it looks like. So this was a pain because of course I didn't map the bricks before placing them. I placed them and then realized, yeah, I could project them from the front, but then I get weird texture stretching and so on. Yeah, it was an uh, entire project on its own. And then I tried to apply a texture to it and it looked like crap. Maybe I still have this version. <laughs> and I show you why it looked crap, because um, you got uh, what's between those bricks. I don't know the correct architectural term, but it's this white stuff here in between. And uh, the other thing is that it looked way too regular. So first, I, if I wanted to texture something with brick textures, I had to, well, I would have had to manually uh, each position each uh, brick in the texture, need to stretch it that it matches exactly the actual brick uh, uh, text, uh, not texture, uh, mesh, the actual polygons that I have. I tried to cheat my way around it. Uh, by just using a generic brownish red texture and it looks like it's a generic brownish texture despite everything and when you come closely and just look at it from an angle it doesn't really look like bricks anymore and the biggest problem I've had is I realized that when you go closer or even when you don't go closer it's just those very harsh uh, uh, and defined outlines here. Bricks don't have, especially if they're older, they don't have these super sharp edges. Of course not, but again, uh, just to save on polygons, it's much easier if everyone just has here uh, that each cube, each brick has just two triangles on each side. Then, like I said, I realized, yeah, this is probably not going to work and yeah, I'm, I won't be happy with this. And so currently, this is where I'm at with this model right now. The white stuff is called mortar. Yeah, right. This this makes sense. It's in German. It's something similar. It's called myrtle. It's yeah. It's <laughs> it's pretty close. So um, apparently this is why. Oh my God! Didn't I save it? Please, please. Oh my God! I hope I saved it. So let me just check it here in the explorer. Maybe I just saved it under a different name or in a different directory or forgot oh good yes i just forgot to add ma at the end 
Yes, I want to change it. There we go. Oh, good. Good, still got it. <laughs> yeah, this is the current version. And you can see it looks, uh, in terms of wireframe, a little bit differently. Because now you got all the polygons uh, here in those bricks that I yeah, manually placed and manually m messed up that they look a little bit older and tried also to keep the polygon count down as much as I could but again so if you look at those from an angle they look much more like actual bricks and for the rest I thought it's okay if I use um, just normal maps because just those there on these fringes will be the most pronounced um, geometry or the most pronounced details that you'll be looking at for example if you're maybe investigating something that's hidden there my at least personally I would just look at those window sills there and those little whatever those call those yeah fringes i'm not quite sure with the uh, english architectural terms despite having read a lot of lovecraft anyway yeah i thought um this is at least um where it's more important to have decent geometry and the rest i could cheat my way around with normal maps so you might ask how many uh, triangles and polygons this thing here has and right now this has twelve thousand uh triangles which is still too much for this wall segment but uh, yeah, I haven't uh, tried to reduce any of um, those that are here present in those bricks. So um, yeah, finally, after 45 minutes of talking <laughs> about what I have done so far, um, what I will be doing is uh, trying to clean up the geometry, which is mostly done actually, and uh, try to get uh, the polygon count down on those bricks and then texture the entire thing that I can use it as a modular piece and just plop it there in unity and use it for this wall here. This is at least the plan for today. So, um, right. And one thing I want to get started with first is uh, to get uh, the mesh right, because before you do any kind of texture mapping, UV mapping, you want to get the modeling stage done. This is not 100% true, because sometimes it's better if you UV, UV map something before you're finished modeling, mostly in terms of deformers. For example, if you have a coil that's just rolled up for something, maybe a spring or anything, um, and it would be easier if you start with a very long cylinder and just map the cylinder and then you deform it and coil it up because then in your UV map you just have this long cylinder to map and not to worry about how do I map a coil from inside outside because it's just everything is overlapping no matter from which side you're looking at it. So those are the exceptions. But in my case here, let me quickly show you my UV map for uh, this one here. Um, yeah, the UV map is the entire square you can see now in this window. So, um, and only parts of it are used. For example, this part here is the entire front. Well, it's not the entire front, it's just uh, starting from, from this middle part here. And because I thought this lower part here, since it was supposed to be just mortar, Thank you for uh, the the word, the vocabulary. Um, and since it's it was meant to be occluded by this brick geometry, I could devote a much smaller space there for the textures, just less pixels in the texture I would need for these parts. Because, like I said, they're just visible between what, what you see between the bricks. And again, this thing here, right, that slots in between that has even less polygons uh, or less pixels of the texture is the outside. Why did I keep the outside? Usually anything that's facing away from the player where the player won't be able to be looking at it. For example, if you get the legs of a table, they don't need to have uh, yeah at the very base the polygon because the table will always be standing, well, most of the time at least, on the ground, so you don't need polygons for this. But for this, I uh, decided to have a very rough geometry outside. The reason for this is maybe you want to have some kind of light source shining in from the outside, and if you don't have any faces on the outside, then the, a directional light would be just coming through as is. So this is why I needed ex 
essentially for shadow casting this <laughs> to make it short. Then you can see here I have a plane on, on top as well as on the bottom. Um, those I have in here for baking the occlusion map, which we will do later. So I'm just going to hide it. But yeah, first let's yeah let's fix the geometry. One thing that you can see here is when I highlight one of those bricks, you can see here I've mapped the bricks already, but they are exactly overlapping uh, um, themselves there in the texture page on, on in the UV map. So essentially if I put one texture here, every brick would look exactly the same. And yeah, I hate this as a player, especially when I notice a repetition where it's just, you can really see uh, maybe a texture tiling in, not even in the distance. And yeah, again, it's my personal problems that I have in terms of quality. And since I thought yeah, I, I, I can't deal with them when when someone else uh, does it. Maybe in my own games I could get it right, for example. So, okay, so one thing that I want to change right now is I want to lift um, this thing here. I'm not, again, I'm not quite sure what's it called. Uh, well, no, this was part of the brick. Um, yeah, that essentially right now you can see between the bricks that they are just uh, set on top there. So essentially the mortar is missing. Uh, and yeah, I want this uh, not to be the case. So I just select here, let me switch over to wireframe and select here all the edges on this one and this edge I need as well. And so now I can just move up here this edge that it's looks much better like this like so so yeah it's the mortar that's between those bricks and maybe the bricks I want at least those to extrude a little further from um, the wall just a little bit like so yeah this looks much I think it looks much, uh, well, it's still not enough because you can, in this case, you can see um, the wall, um, yeah, popping through here. So apparently it was not enough. It's not enough. Yeah, I think, I think this works. This works well. Cool. So let's do pretty much something similar here uh, on top on this window sill here. I just uh, want to position those a little bit uh, more realistically, if that makes sense, but yeah, I don't quite know how. <laughs> but yeah, this is just, just trying things out. So if I move them a bit further and a bit higher, like this, yeah, I think this, this could work. You know what, maybe I need to make them a little bit wider, each brick individually, so that it's not, uh, the gaps between them are not that big. So let's give this a try. R for resize, there we go. Oh, okay, so. Like, like this, I think. I would assume this looks okay. So um, I can notice a small kind of repetition there, in the, at least in the placement. So I'm just trying to get those a little bit more. I mean, they look a bit too random even, and I think this is what, what I don't like about it. But then again, their faces here, the fronts uh, look a bit too, too similar because apparently I didn't squash them in enough. Um, okay, so um, what to do? Um, first thing is that I will need uh, to delete any superfluous, if that's a word, um, triangles or faces that we won't be seeing when we are looking at it uh, from where we are supposed to be looking at it in, in the game, which is yeah from, from a position like this. So, uh, for example, in this brick here, we won't see anything that's there on the sides and on the back. And those are just uh, uh, yeah polygons that will need to be calculated. But since we never see them in the game, they aren't really that necessary. But first, I want to uh, make sure that um, there are UV maps that I can um, that each brick has an individual map, or well, not an individual map uh, that they are spaced apart on the map, because right now they are all overlapping. 
so let me just quickly show it to you so um, let's move here this UV shell and when I move it here you can see yeah I mean some I rotated some I flipped but essentially they are sharing the same texture so I want yeah I want to get those apart and I can do this with my tools if I find them hide UV tools oh okay so they were here on on the other screen so um, yeah I got a couple of tools here that should help me and the one that I want is here under uh, unstack shells stack shells unstack shells so and it's working and it didn't do anything very helpful Maya very helpful so maybe if I say randomized shells does this help well not really gather shells shells the gathering yeah now they are here on this UV map one <laughs> this, really this didn't help a lot okay so essentially I'm down to doing this placement manually so I just move them somewhere outside because um, UVs are always between here 0 and 1 I mean always usually I, I, I would say because if you create UVs of something by mapping it's always between 1 and 0 and when I'm working on placements and so on where I know I will be moving things around that they don't overlap I usually place them in just uh, an adjacent uh, part of the UV map so that yeah when I map something that it's not being occluded as simple as that okay so um, yeah this is a little bit tedious but I mean in the end a lot of things are when you don't know how to to use the tools correctly so what I will do is now I just try to see which are close to each other and just place them roughly next to each other here in the UV map and no this is not the, what I want to have selected UV shell there we go yeah I'm just like I said it's, it's just stupid work but now when I select them all you can see there that they're roughly next to each other and yeah I just do this first to get them in the right order and then I can do some more or some better ways of aligning them there on uh, on the texture map on the UV map so let's zoom out a little bit further here yeah I, I would assume this is all not very interesting but um, yeah I like to do this as early as I can because then I'm quite sure that the textures really work where they should be another trick is of course um, since you only got a, a certain amount of uh, pixels I mean with the UV map you can tell uh, you can say yeah I would need a, a 3k map a 2k map yeah 3k is very rare <laughs> uh, so it's it's one th or a 1k map but then of course how much space you devote inside this map to a certain polygon this defines yeah if something looks more detailed than something else and I always try to imagine where the player would be looking at in this case like I said it's a detective game so it's everything that's about eye level and I try to make this very detailed and this is that got uh, the, the biggest share in terms of excuse me of, of yeah pixels on the texture map devoted to these objects so um, yeah the order here is correct but they're just literally all over the place but this is fine I can just uh, collect them and here under layout I can probably align them much better so align and snap so I want to linear align probably not first I want to align them all on the upper bounds this worked okay then I just want to um, space them evenly but I'm not quite sure how this works there in Maya um, linear align do I have different kinds of alignments here no linear align means just it, it takes a line an imagined line and aligns it on this this doesn't help yeah and it takes takes quite a long time to calculate okay so instead I think I will just snap them manually together for now 
and sorry i uh, always uh, using the incorrect zoom method because uh, in maya if you want to move something you select it uh, you're not selected but you move it via middle mouse button or like i do here with the left mouse button if you find their transformation arrows okay so slowly getting there right now i'm not really concerned about the size because in the end I will always be scaling it up and down. Maybe I don't need to display the checkerboard each and every time. <laughs> yeah, the alignment I just noticed, it, it rotated the shells slightly, so this is not good, but it's been too long for me to undo now. So yeah, I just have to live with it, and this means that I will try to straighten them out later when I'm finished here. Again, yeah, you usually don't have to do stuff like that. But again, for me, it's like I really don't like it when something has the exact same texture and it, it really yeah pulls me out of the game, especially when it tries so much to depict a, a realistic world and then everyone, for example, is having the exact same things in their drawers. It just, yeah, I just don't like it. And this is, this is why I torture myself like this. <laughs> Um, to, to at least try to mitigate it and then probably I will dial back a notch uh, and because I realize how much work it actually is. So now I have the, everything here between 1 and 0 and you can see here uh, on the checkerboard size how much of uh, how many pixels I can devote per each brick but again the cool thing is now that I can pretty much have it on a per brick basis. The downside is now that since I moved and scaled the bricks around that some things there will be upside down, others will be flipped and so on and so forth. So um, I can try to find, yeah, this is just a tool to shade uh, when there are overlapping uh, UVs. For example, if I just move them on top of each other, you can see it. the blue is getting a bit darker where they are overlapping. Okay, so the next thing is, like I said, is that I need to rotate them, that they aren't that crooked. And um, there's also a helpful tool, I, I hope, <laughs> um, that, that works for this. And it's called, if I can find it, transform, unfold, create, match UV, snap and stack, snap together. No, something along those lines. <laughs> Yeah, UV sets, you can have multiple UV sets, but I'm not quite sure how Unity handles those, so I'll stay clear of them. Unfold straighten UVs, this is what I want. And give my poor computer a couple of seconds, and I hope that this will get this slight rotation there in the UV map out. Let's knock on wood. Because, I mean, it's still a couple of thousands faces, so it's okay that it takes a while to find where they are lining up. up. But then again, uh, with Maya, sometimes you really find strange uh, ways how this, the tools behave. Because in the end, they are just scripts uh, written in the Mel language. I think it's called Maya Enhanced Language or something. You can also write it in Python, but yeah, some, some things you can uh, never predict how they will turn out. And Sharks Interactive says, hey, hey, Sharks, uh, thank you so much for dropping by. I'm sorry you, uh, you, you just caught me while I was uh, waiting for Maya to finish uh, lining up uh, all the UVs in this UV set because I want to get them straight. Uh, yeah, let's, let's give it a, some more minutes while we all say praise the unicorns, which means cheers, have a sip of water. <sighs> yeah. Do you also do some things when you when uh, like this? Where, for example, now I'm trying to get this mouse cursor here positioned straight in center, or when you have some progress bars, and um, when you try with your mouse to follow the progress bar on a per pixel basis, just those little games. Maybe my mouse is too sensitive, and now it should work. Uh, it doesn't quite fit in there, right? Does it? Uh Oh, there we go. Thanks. <laughs> so now all those, oh, this was the screen zoom. This is what I wanted to do. So now those uh, uh, UVs are straight again. 
I would hope so. At least uh, on. Yeah, they they look they look they look good, fine. Okay, so I got all those upper bricks uh, there uh, laid out on the UV map. And now the problem is that I need pretty much to do the same thing here with all those here that are on this uh, lower fringe here. And sometimes uh, it's easier <laughs> uh, because this was such a hassle to do this. You know what, I will delete this uh, lower bound here and just do the same thing here and use the bricks that I have from up here which are already mapped. So um, what's in this group? Okay, so this is this group upper bounds which probably I don't need to have in a group anyway. You know what, let's save this as a new version because saving is always good. And Trucks Interactive says, especially when waiting for lighting to bake. Yeah, light baking, man, all those uh, physically correct uh, uh, ray tracing things, they take so long. And it's no matter how fast your computer is, because in the end you will always crank them up so much in terms of quality that you will still wait for half an hour <laughs> for something to finish. I mean, the render times of, uh, since now I'm using this 24 core uh, uh, beast, of an AMD Athlon, the Threadripper. Yeah, I'm still cranking up my renders so much that it still takes a couple of minutes to render an image, which an older computer of mine would have taken days to render. But then again, yeah, it's, I think it's it's the same thing with Pixar. Uh, over a course of many years, they usually render, I forgot the, the correct number, but it's always the same amount per frame. It's like uh, one or two hours per frame, no matter what, what movie they are. But uh, their technology gets better. So this is why always um, it, each, each subsequent film looks better than one before. The only outlier to this was um, cars because of all the ray tracing that needed to be done. So I think they rendered like five hours per frame on cars. Because uh, the render man renderer, which is uh, Pixar's renderer of choice, or which they designed actually um, and developed, um, it's man. This uh, it is just a fake. Uh, it, it tries to fake so much, uh, especially with motion blur. When you add motion blur, it renders faster because, um, uh, like for example, mental ray uh, rendered. If you needed something like motion blur, it would render it a couple of times and then just blend all those images together and so if you had like 12 motion samples it would render it 12 times and then just blend it together. Uh, render man, Pixar's render man knows yeah you won't see the details anyway and uh, um, cleverly tries uh, to, to find out which details you won't see and then just hide those or not render those and actually rendering with motion blur. I'm not quite sure how it is nowadays but 10 years back or so, rendering with motion blur in RenderMan was much faster than without, for example. But the real ray tracing for actual reflections, uh, yeah, they RenderMan always cheated uh, their way around it. It's it's way around it, and yeah, it was it was uh, when it when you really had to do some ray tracing, it it just took took so so long. Personally, I never rendered with RenderMan because, like I said, it was proprietary, and I only had a demo version. I thought, yeah, do I really want to get familiar with render man and then be unable to do anything else so i spent my time uh, invested my time in um what's it called mental ray but then mental ray was bought by nvidia and then nvidia usually mental ray was bundled with maya and this is why i really uh, it was uh, it was a little bit fidgety in terms of you uh, you had to fiddle around uh, with it a lot to get good results and really know what values you could tweak and should be tweaking and others that were just a waste of time literally and yeah um, after many years i was felt quite proficient with mental ray and then with maya um since it was bought by nvidia mental ray as i said um it mental ray wasn't part of maya anymore but the arnold renderer was now all of a sudden so everything that i had learned in terms of mental ray was um, yeah not available to me anymore and I had to get started with Arnold. Uh, for those who don't know, Arnold is uh, the go-to renderer of, um, I think it was developed for Sony Imageworks, I think at the first Spider-Man movie from 19, no, it was 2003, 
2002, the one with Toby McGuire. Um, they used Arnold there, and I saw a demonstration of it, which is really cool with Arnold because uh, you could. Uh, embed uh, hooks and links to the actual uh, scene in the render. For example, you do a rendering of a city block and then you realize, ha, huh, this one thing, this looks strange. And then you can click at it uh, on the rendered image and have it selected the geometry in your 3D editing software of choice because it got uh, yeah the, the ID baked into the final rendering which is a huge boon especially in terms of, of lighting because it, you also don't need to re-render or re-transform of course the geometry when you're doing lighting because it has cached or stored the lighting information so relighting in in Arnold is pretty fast but like I said again I, I was used to to mental ray and I decried it dearly um, that I just lost this wonderful renderer that I spent so many years getting to grips with but I get with the times, it's just old man Phil renting. Um, Sharks Interactive says, even with the render farms and stuff, uh, sorry, I'm, I don't uh, know which uh, to which this refers to, but I would uh, think to the render times with, with uh, Pixar. And yes, I think with their farms, uh, I mean, in the end, uh, you give one uh, render node, one, one computer in the farm, one frame to render, essentially. So, um, of course, when you got a render farm with 5,000 uh, nodes, yeah, you would render 5,000 frames in one hour. So, yeah, I think, I think this is how it goes down. Um, dog, dogs are barking again outside now. So, yeah, it's, it's already the dog days are upon us. Yeah, it's not very interesting what I'm doing here. It's just, yeah, you can probably tell. It's just, shut up. <laughs> it's just I'm, I'm, I'm nudging all those bricks around to have them. The, the intention for this is that I just can copy their UVs and just position them down. And hey, presto, I got new UVs uh, for this part here, which I don't have to yeah, UV map again. So, and I even got more bricks than I would need here. So I can delete those here. That's the last one that I need. And I can even cut it, cut it off where I don't need it. So let's have a look at it from the side. And it looks wonderfully irregular, wonderfully human, even more so than what I have here. So, um, yeah, which is, which is good. So again, and now we can well, let's save it first, and then uh, we try to yeah get rid of uh, to uh, as many faces that we won't be seeing anyway. Um, yeah, anyhow, I forgot how I started the sentence. <laughs> um, lower. Okay, so um, those are my UV shells for the lower bricks. Let's move them out of the way. Just that they, when I combine everything, just that they con won't collide with the upper bricks but right now you can see here it looks it looks okay and because I try to save some size here some real estate here because um, yeah it's it's a little bit of a puzzle game it's it's, it's like playing is a, a Tetris advanced in a sense is you of course you want to maximize uh, all the pixels that you have here on your texture map on your little square without any pixels wasted but then again of course you also want it to have everything have the most uh, pixels available to it that it needs while also keeping the entire size of the of the of the render uh, uh, of the texture map down and so on and so forth so it's all about uh, clever packing packing not packing I'm sorry, my English is usually a little bit ambivalent in my uh, pronunciation. So, uh, yeah, thank you for bearing <laughs> with me. So if, if you don't understand a thing, I just I just uh, um, mark it down as sorry for my Germanisms. Yeah, Germanisms, uh, uh, that's actually a real word. I've, I've learned uh, about this term when I was you know, studying uh, English. Uh, yeah, I, I was actually studying English before I started 3D animation because I didn't know much to do, uh, what to do with my life and never had problems with English in school until I really started it to learn it at university. And pretty much anything in terms of um, 
yeah, just usage that I built up, get, you know, getting a feeling for a language, not really following the rules or so. So this is probably why my English is half the time incorrect is, um, yeah. And in, in on the university, they completely um, trained it trained me differently so i wasn't sure anymore to to trust my gut or not or or to to follow the weird rules and then there was this one test in language systems there's one exam where i thought yeah this went awfully well i think i might have a c probably a b and if i'm lucky i get an a and fun fact, it was a straight F because each uh, 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 question that I thought, ha, huh, that's that's clearly a trap. It wasn't a trap. And each one that I didn't see coming, that that was a trap. So yeah, this is my English didn't didn't progress far from there. And Germanisms is uh, w what my teacher there called uh, pretty much anything that's, uh, yeah, the words are correct in English. But the grammar is weird because you're using German gr grammar for English sentences. And for example, uh, this is a very fun example, is in German to get something is uh, becommen. And it sounds awfully a lot like becoming, right, in English. And some people uh, m mix this up and when they say, for example, in uh, <laughs> when they order something in a restaurant, and uh, in German you say, Ich bekomme bitte uh, milk. So I, 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 I'll have milk. Please get me milk, essentially. And when you say this uh, in, with become and becommen, when you mix this up, uh, in English you will say, I become a hamburger, please. And there was a witness this once and the chef said, Yeah, show me. No, uh, I, I become a hamburger, please. And I said, show me. Very awkward. At least it wasn't part of my group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this completely went off the rail. I wanted to uh, to talk a bit about uh, texturing and modeling and UV mapping. And now I'm talking about Germanisms in English. I'm really sorry for the detour. At least it made sharks interactive love. <laughs> so yeah, let's all be become a hamburger, please. <laughs> okay, so I don't think I can pack those much more tightly. I mean, there's still some breathing room. <laughs> But yeah, it's 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 good. So those are my bricks in the final map that will uh, encompass this entire square region there. Okay, so let's save it and finally, finally, let's try to get rid of some of the polygons that we won't be needing. Okay, so save a new version <laughs> in case I make something uh, break and. Then let's go into isolation in this case here. And uh, I can clearly see that I won't be needing many of those faces here. So I just select them if I'm good at selecting things and just remove them. Okay, so there I selected the entire loop, which I don't want. You know what, let's, let's try to select it like this. And when I switch back to see if anything yellow selected shows up that I still need and apparently it it does not so this is good so I can hit delete on these and now oh, this was uh, again <laughs> made a selection there so I can also delete these and do I need those here yes uh, the, those still pop through from under the window so I probably will need these but I could move up uh, their polygons there so that they don't need to be this far or if I really want to save something I can move up this loop here Hope you can see it let me zoom in a bit I could move up this loop here that it just extends underneath this window here and then I can even get rid of the polygons on the back where are they but yeah, right now I make it, I undo it because I need to do this for all, of course, all the bricks in this row. But hey, at least I, I know what to delete. And of course, in terms of from the underside, what can I delete there? I think I can also delete these faces here. Do I see them? No. Or did I just delete something that was visible? Yes, actually I did. So maybe keep keep those. But again, I don't need them as far there. So apparently this is 
How about those here? <laughs> yeah, you, you can see that I'm really trying to figure out uh, how, how to save as much as possible without sacrificing anything in terms of visibility. Again, this is, you, you can probably see, it, this takes quite some nudging there and, and really making sure uh, that you're not over eager in terms of what to delete. But again, um, you really want to see uh, what you're doing and make it make it possible to undo it. Shark says, uh, what are you uh, working on right now? So uh, yeah, it's this section here of a wall and uh, which should go here in my demo level on this side here of the warehouse. So uh, I, I have planned here for three of those segments to go next to each other. And this is what should go in there. And again, like I said, because I'm a solo dev and I don't have uh, to pay anyone doing this, I can spend as much time uh, doing, uh, uh, yeah, fretting over details <laughs> like, like so. So again, uh, now I get a better understanding of what I need and what I don't need. So I think I can just select without much thought these faces and check back if any of those are visible to the player and no they are not and now with that knowledge i think i can do this for pretty much the entire remaining row just so that i know okay i made this one already and i did this one so all the other bricks there i can isolate and let's look at it from the side view, left view, there we go. Okay, but now I don't know which side is facing to the front. So um, yeah, <laughs> I try now uh, to pick this side here and then have a look at it. And oh, I just selected one of those bricks because of course I to select multiple bricks. Oh. Okay, so just an experiment to know which side is facing to the front. Um, I just select, um, no, not move it, select what's facing to the front and left view. Okay, so our front is on this side, but I'm not quite sure how it looks on the camera. So maybe it be on this side, but just, just for me. So it's on the left side of my screen here. This is the front side. Okay, so I can select all of these here and should be good in these bricks of so face. Apparently I unselected brick number four for some reason. Ah, Maya, just, just don't ask. And apparently it's just still this one. Okay, this one brick. Anyway, okay, let's, let's try this differently. I will combine all those bricks to one mesh and then I can better select them. So um, just uh, that we know how much polygons we will save. Uh, when we started, we had 12,500 triangles on everything. So, and right now in this selection, let me show you. This selection, we got 5,700 triangles, which is a lot. And I hope I can get this down at least to 3,000. So my budget for this wall section is about 7,000 polygons, which is still a lot uh, for uh, just a wall section. But then again, there won't be that much in this scene. So I think for the entire scene, I want to stay at around 100 to 150,000 polygons at maximum. Okay, so um, mesh combine. Please don't crash. Okay, good. We're back. And now I got everything there combined. And no, not this smash. Where are we again? Okay, this is what I want to select. Um, left view, right. Then I isolate it and select all the faces. Just to be a little bit conservative there. And oh, I just had it selected. Please don't unselect it again. Good, so switch back to perspective view and make sure that none of the things that I want to keep are visibly selected. So this is good. Delete, delete. So this is how it looks on from, from the other side. So yeah, a lot, a lot of things were deleted. This is good. 
Get some Z fighting here, but this is good because you won't be seeing it. Haha. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so how many polygons do we have now on this selection? It's 3100. So this is pretty good, actually. This is pretty good. Maybe we can uh, reduce the polygon count even further by using another Maya tool that might or might not work, but so far I'm pretty happy. Um, I will also add this, the other bricks to this mesh just to be on the safe side that everything is contained in one mesh. So combine, please don't crash. Good, everything worked. Edit, delete construction history. And this is good because in Maya there's a history. Oh, what did I do? There's a history for everything. So you can undo pretty much on a per object basis, but it's very fiddly because you have to go into a different editor, which is more of a flow chart of how things are uh, yeah, uh, combined together and how you arrived at one thing because you can delete something, some segments, then add new segments, then do a UV mapping and you can even insert a step in between, but then everything else gets messed up. So this is why I usually don't make any use of it. Okay, so let's uh, do pretty much the same here for um, what we got here on the bottom and I save it again as a new version. And those lower bricks, they are pretty much, um, yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. So let's combine them. Please don't crash, please don't crash. There we go. Everything's combined. And let's look at them from the left view. There we go. And face. And I think those were safe to delete. Let's check again. Yeah, nothing of importance is visible here. And let's look, we will be going from 5,320 triangles down to 3,000. Again, pretty cool, pretty cool. And again, it's it's really, you. I didn't delete anything that you would be missing as a player. So next thing that I can do is go even further and select the back caps of those bricks and saved something again. And now really, because we're here such low, maybe I can get away with deleting those uh, underlying polygons there. But then again, I don't want to be um, too uh, uh, cautious and delete too many polygons because then maybe I get weird artifacts, especially when it comes to using um, the light source, because when you light it from, from the bottom and there aren't any uh, triangles to cast shadows, then it might look weird. Uh, talking about looking weird, um, here this uh, side of the brick that will be when we'll be uh, placing those segments next to each other. Um, this one will uh, protrude into this side of this wall, of the copy of this wall anyway, so we probably don't need this part here of this brick as well, which is quite good. And so far I think this is as much as we can manually delete on those uh, uh, bricks and let's just let me check again on those here if there is still something that can be deleted yeah also here those those back caps I also forgot to delete which uh, saves us some more polygons even like this and finally I thought I can delete those and then just move um, these things here the, the remainders just a bit up that they don't um, yeah that they extend into um, the window here I could do this like like so like I'm doing now and I think this is this is yeah how we'll do it so maybe there will be st some stretching on those um, loops there but I think it should be it should be all right alternatively I could have even um, used the window and just uh, moved it just an inch forward but so far, so good. So we went from 15,000 polygons for this entire thing, was it 15,000, down to 6,045, which is quite good, at least in my book. So, um, by the way, this was 7,000 polygons was also the polygon count that I had when I was using um, the entirely blocky 
uh, sharp-edged bricks that I had before, but they, they were just cubes elongated and stacked. Uh, so actually now with this version here we got higher fidelity bricks uh, where we can see them actually and and even have a lower polygon count, so which is pretty good, I would say. And maybe, maybe if it looks really weird, this transition there, maybe we can add some more bricks there on the wall, should we need it, but I hope I don't need to. <laughs> okay, so um, let's save this again and delete all the entire history. And let's try to squeeze out even some more savings. Okay, so one tool I have here in Maya is under Mesh or Edit Mesh. I'm not quite sure. They move things around in the menus uh, so often before. Um, they did it so often and so often before. Yeah, you, you, you get my point. Sorry, I'm, I'm in the middle of a thought and then I'm <laughs> two miles in, in advanced from there. So I want to have this, no, not clean up. I want to have it uh, retopologize, reduce. This is what I want. And my reduce options are here on the other screen. And I want to say it, I want to reduce it by 50% and preserve quads, sharpness, symmetry, feature, preservation, UV borders. Now what UV borders I want to preserve actually. And advanced options and the vertex index. Yeah, I've never used the vertex index map. So uh, I have saved it because it might crash. This is my, save it again <laughs> and hit apply and see how much this works. And we can see here even the preview and this doesn't look good. <laughs> so if I turn up the percentage there, um, yeah, it loses even more. So it, I can't have it at 50%, but maybe, you know what, if I get it even 5%, um, hmm. The problem is that the first polygons that are being reduced are the ones on the edges and actually I want to keep the edges so this is this is not really helpful so mesh borders yeah those I really can't change here after the fact so hmm um yeah this this is, doesn't doesn't work actually <laughs> so yeah I just say undo undo and I will try here to say Hard edges, creased edges. Yeah, I don't have any hard edges there, but hmm. Mesh borders, feature preservation. Let's say the mesh borders I want at 90% 90 to be retained. Let's try this. And let's move here the percentage from 40% yeah. Yeah, I don't think this is going to work too well. 80% reduction is too much, 20% uh, even nibbles away on some of the details. 10% reduction, yeah, this might work, but I can already see some, yeah, some weird things happening there. With 0%, of course, it retains these things here. Yeah, I don't think that we will be able to get any more savings in, in this regard. You know what, the last thing I could try to do is to retopologize. Maybe this helps, maybe it won't. So far, just to uh, to get um, a snapshot is we have 2,674 triangles, so 2,600 triangles. And I will try save, of course, and retopologize or remesh. Let's try remesh. Collapse, threshold, tessellate borders. Uh, whatever man, <laughs> that's just applied. And now we got, uh, how many triangles? 8,000. So this was not too helpful. So let's not retopologize. Let's do, uh, this was remesh. Let's try retopologize and say our target face count. Let's say, yeah, let's be uh, moderate and say 1,700 faces we want in this new topology and have Maya figure out how to retopologize everything. I'm not quite sure that this will work. Uh, I mean, maybe it will work in terms of the mesh, but then again, I have to check on the UVs that I so laboriously mapped that they still match up to what I want. So while um, the wheel is spinning, I will have another, another sip of water. Cheers to you and thank you so much for watching me in my struggles. Phil versus Maya and I have never won. Has always been a draw so far. 
Praise the unicorn. Praise the unicorn. Okay, so um, retopologization. Retopologize. This retopology thing <laughs> is uh, taking longer than expected. But uh, thankfully, Maya says that I can cancel at any time by pressing the ESC key. So this must be close to the any key, but I haven't found it so far. Uh, crumbs on my keyboard. So, okay, so retopolization has been finished. And from <laughs> now we at 57,000 triangles. Uh, yeah, this, I mean, the topology looks actually quite nice for, for what it is, but thanks Maya but no thanks so undo yeah I think this is what we what we will end up with the last thing that I want to try is to make those uh, fr front faces there of uh, of those bricks I want to give them a little bit more character I will want to deform them just a little bit more and how to do this with the sculpting tools uh, not to be confused with the scalping tools um, so I use uh, maybe maybe this uh, stamp tool here and yeah I can just uh, use the, just uh, yeah draw up here this this uh, shape here and then if I let go it will be stamped onto the mesh of these things uh, it didn't work at all right now well, not at all. You can see here just a slight little dent in here. If I undo this, it will be gone. So it, it kind of works, but yeah, not, not quite. Because usually you do this on a very high uh, resolution mesh and not on this very low poly thing that I have here. But in, you know what? Instead of using stamps, I uh, will try to use it as a brush texture if this uh, works. Um, by the way, this is my sculpting shelf and my sculpting tools. So I'm um, just wondering. Mm, this looks looks okay from <laughs> from the thumbnail. What's it called? This is the foamy tool. So it maybe it adds just some splotches on something. If I find my mouse pointer again, there we go. So if I draw over it, I uh, didn't see anything because the size is zero. Let's use size one. And yeah, it's one is too much. By the way, I have set up my units that one is one meter. So let's go with 0, 0.01, which should be the strength, should be one centimeter. And yeah, this looks a bit better now. Um, at least, I mean, in theory, it's working right now because of uh, the angle at which I painted it. You can see here, it got some weird deformations, which I don't like, but at least in, in principle, it works. So let's make the strength is set at 15. The units, let's set the strength to five and I set my size to one, uh, 0.1. So it, this is one decimeter for those of you who are keeping track with uh, um, metric units. It's one tenth of a meter. So yeah, just yeah, I don't like it because now they, they just feel a little bit bloated like this. Was it Damien Hurst? Um, those, uh, this culture of fat chrome cars? Uh, never mind. So, okay, maybe this is not what I wanted. Actually, I wanted just to have it to give it some kind of, uh, yeah, of, of texture in a sense. So maybe stylus stamp. I mean, this stamp tool I used before, but use stamp. Let's pick one and I pick this uh, stone blocks brick wall here and I'm not quite sure if Maya is is really enjoying to have this kind of content browser because whenever I open it it just takes so long to load and it's really clunky and okay now it, it just loaded here the screenshot so uh, the thumbnail so I think this is working now but when I paint it yeah okay so now I'm painting here with um, with this texture here. Like I said, because it's so low poly what I have here, um, maybe just give one here that's just a little bit receded there on the edge. 
because it's so low poly, it's pretty. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of texture I'm painting with, because each <laughs> each texture that I use will deform it in some way or another, and hopefully I will like it or not. But yeah, as long as it's a bit deformed here from the side, this looks this looks so much more realistic than what we've had before. Maybe I overdid things uh, in this one here. So yeah, if I use the, the control key, I can do the inverse. So just normal clicking is build up and hitting control and clicking is the opposite. So yeah, this is already very roughed up. So let's smoothen this out a bit. <clears throat> Where's my smooth tool? This one here. So let's, yeah, the smooth tool is pretty strong, but I think it works. It works. Okay, so let's, let's call it a day on this one then. And yeah, this was probably too much because now everything is there in the plaster, in the mortar. So if I move it out a little bit further, I will probably have problems here on the back where I closed it so uh, much that it barely uh, <laughs> it barely touches um, the the window frame there. So yeah, apparently I was a little bit too strong uh, with my sculpting. But then again, nothing we can't fix. So first, I need uh, my uh, origin point or my yeah, center pivot. There we go. That I can try to move it out, but yeah, this doesn't really help much. So. You know what, I will keep it as it is and just use the sculpting tool again and just try to get everything out of the clipping range as again. So, ah, man, game development is, is just back and forth, back and forth all the time. But the cool thing about this is that each time you do this, it things just get better. And I mean, in the end, that's what you want, right? So, okay. Yeah, the cool thing, like I said, is now that it looks really, in a sense, uh, uh, plausible and realistic. Um, maybe maybe not this brick here that's weirdly shaped now with the other one. Yeah, this also <laughs> didn't make things better, actually. Uh, I don't have a way to say, yeah, return to how you were before. Maybe I can... Um, no, this also does not work. Yeah, let's, let's try and use this smooth tool again, but the strength instead of 100, I say 10. And be very careful there. I mean, in the end, when this is mapped and textured, it will look much better anyway. So, yeah, smoothing things a bit where it looks weird in the places where it does, but so far. Yeah, you know what, let's let's say I'm, I'm happy with this, let's go with this. And this one brick here sticks out a bit too much, actually. But, ah, what the hell, what the hell, looks realistic, I would say. So, um, you know what, let's save this version as well and then have a look at the UV maps, because like I said, uh, each brick is turned and twisted after I had mapped it with the UV map, so we will see how it looks in the map. But save as a new version, and now delete all history. This is what we do, we delete the history. So, this is an empty group. Those are empty groups, and this group is also empty. I hope I didn't delete anything that I will need later. So yeah, we got the bricks lower and we got the bricks upper or bricks sill. So there we go. And the entire thing, including the window with these little window barn dividers, everything, uh, even with the planes has 6045 uh, triangles. So I think this is I think this is cool. Okay, so let's uh, do some uh, mapping then and just check that the UV map is still looking good and also rework the UV map for the rest here. Like I said, this was excuse me, this was mapped when I still decided everything should be covered up by by the actual uh, bricks uh, that were meshed. Um, yeah, this is 
this is what remains here of the bricks that we have on top. Everything else here, all those little uh, holes there, they are deleted. So, um, why is this red? Is this where there's an overlap going on? No, I think red is something where the bricks are being stretched. I mean, it doesn't make sense now, but yeah, I will just try to position them again, um, that they are not taking up too much space of each other and still in one long row because that's much easier to, to uh, texture them when I know everything that's supposed to be on one row is also on one row in Photoshop. So yeah, we saved some polygons there. We're still wasting well a bit of, of UV space here, but yeah, maybe I can I can get this. Maybe it's not so bad that we don't we won't be needing every last pixel of the texture map anyway. So yeah, again this is the boring part, but it's it's really zen like. With UV mapping, a lot of people in college uh, realized that they really hated it. And sometimes they gave their stuff for me to map because I like to be very uh, diligent about it. And yeah, I like to have uh, to, to make things look nice also there on the UV map. And also you make your life much easier when you know where everything is laid out. Because of course you can have automatic mapping where Maya decides uh, where something should be placed and where it should, or which uh, planes, uh, projection planes to use to place something and so on and so forth. So yeah, it's, and in the end, you really have to use uh, trial and error methods to really find out what is going on. And sometimes this takes much longer than just doing it thoroughly by hand. So here we get an overlap on this one here. Not quite sure if I can, if I want to keep it, I'm talking about this overlap here. Maybe it's not so bad. Okay, let's find out actually where, what di what is this face that is overlapping? Where, where is this pro problematic little, little face here? So let, I'm, I'm just uh, selecting them so that the light up here and okay, so it's, it's those four faces that aren't visible at all in this case, so I can also safely delete them, which is good. So, and other problem solved. So yeah, this is why, um, for me at least, it's it's very helpful if you do mapping and placing pretty much concurrently, so you're just going back and forth and checking against everything so that everything um, works uh, together well. So I have the uh, same thing here with those uh, three little three little faces. Can we get rid of those? And I think, I think we can. Nobody, nobody's going to miss them. Uh, Sharks Interactive says on the chat, according to a Reddit thread, red UVs means the normal is flipped. Oh, thank you so much. This, oh, this is really helpful. Thank you for, I, I never knew. I always thought there's some kind of stretching going on, but I think this is, the UV stretching is uh, this uh, overview of them. So uh, again, we have to flip the normals on the, those. Man, that's really helpful, thank you. Okay, so let's try and see also on those. Yeah, the normals are probably flipped because I flipped the entire model. And what is red here? I think also safe to delete. Wonderful. Saving polygons all the way. Cool. How about how about those three on this one? Um, no, those those we need. Those we need. But yeah, you you only know when you check. So so I think I'm pretty pretty done here. Pretty much done here with um, the UVs on the bricks. And yeah, um, like I said, it's really a luxury if you have every brick individually <laughs> mapped. But again, it's it's really helpful. It's really helpful. So cool. Then let's flip the normals on this one here and see how it translates to the UV map. So those are the UVs uh, that's making up uh, this brick here. I just move it over here, the, the one, just to see if the one is flipped, but it's really hard to tell because it's so small. And yes, of course, 
the one here is mirrored. So if I say, yeah, let's let's try flipping the normals then. Um, UV, no, it's mesh display because normals define how a mesh is going to display. So this is why the menu is called mesh display. And let's reverse the normals. Let's see what happens. Click. And it's not red anymore, but it's it's dark here for some reason, which I also don't like. Let's let's switch off here this preview then. Let's see. Because now, since it's dark, it means we're looking from the inside. So I, actually the normals... Oh my god, what, what am I doing? The normals... Now the normals are flipped. So apparently it's only... It means that it's... The normals are flipped, um, not they are reversed, they are flipped uh, or mirror, they are mirror images. This is a word that I was looking for. So um, undo, 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 there we go. So now I will flip them again. The reason why I flipped them was uh, because I had this one brick deformed and modeled and then I flipped it, uh, just the geometry, but of course the UVs flipped with it as well. Uh, so yeah, yeah, this is really helpful. Thank you so much for looking up that red means flip normals because this is why I always as you've seen it I drag it over the UV and see if the one looks like a mirror image. So yeah, this really helps <laughs> uh, It's it's always a day each time I do something I learn something and those little things. So how how do we? Uh, uh, yeah fix this pretty easily just here and transform we can say um, scale or we don't even have to scale it. We can just say flip in the U or in the V. I just say, yeah, flip, flip the U. Where where was the flip? Just I just saw it. <laughs> oh, there it is. There it is. Sorry. Flip. And flip this. And I mean, here it works. But now for those one that I positioned uh, very uh, thoroughly here. Uh, yeah, let's we have to to look at it uh, individually again <laughs> if I can delete something or not. So yeah, let's have another closer look at these three faces. Where are they? Good. They can go. And uh, it's like I said, it's it's back and forth, but it's always nice to be saving some more polygons here, some more polygons there. How about those three faces? Um, I think, yeah, don't see them. Gone. And there's an overlap. Are we lucky a third time in a row? Um, yes, yes we are. Gone. Beautiful. Beautiful. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, unicorns, a UV map that I can get behind, mostly. There's still a lot of white space. Maybe I would. Yeah, I, I take it back. <laughs> it's it's an okay UV map. Cool. Finally, um, um, the hard part, or at least the tedious part, is done for now. So I delete my entire history again, save a new version, and um, do the UV mapping there on what's remaining. So what I already mapped here is uh, this window because the window will have a different shader. And you can see here the window looks pretty odd. Uh, for one thing is that everything is flipped <laughs> vertically. So let's flip it again. Um, of course I have to select my shells. Then say flip, flip, flip. And the reason for this is that uh, if you imagine that this is an entire 4K map or let's say for a demonstration sake, this is an entire uh, 1K map, so 20, uh, 1024 pixels across and and uh, ahead. No, that's not the word. Vertically and horizontally. So you can see here, the one that's on the bottom is, it has half of the texture map to itself. And the other two parts uh, are divided between yeah the other parts, naturally. The reason for this is because, uh, if I show you here, you can see it's much it's much easier to tell what's happening here. You you got a much better resolution down here because this is the eye level of the player, and of course for the eye level of the player, I want to have the most details in the map, because uh, yeah you in the game you'd be standing I think at this height. So if you look up, it doesn't really matter if there is the text resolution not as good as where you are looking straight ahead.
And this is the reason why I sometimes um, split up my UV maps like this. Um, the downside to this is, of course, you can't use it for maybe angles like this. I mean, of course, you can use it, but it's counterproductive. And the other thing is that it's a little bit harder, especially in Photoshop, because also in Photoshop, if you want to place an image, a scanned image or a photograph over it, yeah, you also have to cut it out and cut it down to match the actual UV map. So this was the window itself. Then I got, um, let me see here. Yeah, this is the window pane. And uh, this, the, the part of the frame is uh, already mapped. It's, um, yeah, it's yeah, just the, the parts of the, of the individual frame. So those are just very compressed uh, um, little shells uh, again i just noticed that uh, also those are red man thank you so much for 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 checking this this is something that i've i mean there's a lot of things that you wonder huh what is this about but then in the end yeah you you never really never really look at it because you think yes yeah, just something that's a little annoying or it's just a little puzzling but do you really want to check it out what it really means and apparently i i never did and so it's really it's really great thank you Cool. Okay, so uh, the rest is still, it's this part. It's this part that still needs to be mapped. And the back part, I think the back segment is already mapped. Yeah, let's make sure, let's open the UV editor. And there are different methods to map something. Um, for those who don't know uh, what mapping, how to map something, essentially is you look at a certain plane onto something. But um, if I'm looking at this from the front, of course, I got no distortions there because like I said, I'm looking at the front. But the problem is with anything that's at this same angle as, as uh, my viewing axis, for example, um, this part here, this one will show up uh, is it is a single pixel if at all so essentially you have to map those things uh, not from the front but from the bottom or from the top and uh, those insets here from the side and then combine everything together and yeah this is the joy slash uh, pain <laughs> of of uv mapping so yeah you can see here it's already mapped but from uh, before so i will do this all over again and map it uh, with a plane. You, of course, you don't have to use it uh, to map it, to project onto it from a certain, yeah, just a plane. It's also possible to do it from a surface uh, of a sphere and then inward. This often helps for things that are, well, yeah, sphere shaped. Then you can also do it for uh, projections that are um, cylindrical and so on and so forth so uh, but in the end like I said personally I always uh, start with um, where do we have it with a planar um, mapping and this is how it looks with the plane again we're mapping it from the other side so this is again why I have to flip it where can I flip it it must be under transform and flip there we go but um, yeah, like I said, if I'm now um, previewing here those uh, uh, this checkerboard here, you can see that the pixels are essentially just stretched here. I have no definition or no information for this because in the UV map, this is just a single, a single yeah point. It's not even it's not even a pixel <laughs> actually. But the rest looks good, so I will keep the rest. And again, I will cut it here roughly in the middle where the player won't be seeing or missing the details when they look up. So um, just to make things less busy on the eyes. Um, but um, you know what, I won't cut it just now, but first I map it and then I will try to cut the segments down to individual sizes. Cool, okay, so like I said, uh, I need all those insets here that didn't get mapped before and just to select them I select what I have mapped and just deselect what I don't need and the things that remain um, here in yellow are those side parts here cool so those uh, again uh, I can select in a planar fashion like I said one from each side but yeah this probably takes a little bit too long 
and there are better tools for this in Maya. There's one that is that I use uh, quite often for individual parts that is automatic mapping, where it tries automatically to find the best plane for each segment or each uh, continuous segment and yeah, just uses a, a certain plane for this to keep the distortions down. But the downside is that it's a lot of individual pieces and parts that you need to stitch together yourself again. So let's hit automatic mapping and we can see here all those parts here on the side um, got, got uh, uh, distributed here one after the other. Let me highlight here the shells so that you can see which part relates to which other. And I think this is already a, a pretty pretty solid planar mapping. So you know what? I will I won't mess with this. I will I will keep it and I say yeah, this is good. So if I highlight now an edge, you can see how this edge translates to something else. So for my uh, for these purposes here, I will stitch them together that they are inside this hole. Otherwise I would have here this big hole inside of my UV map that's not being uh, used. So I just say, where do I have it? Oh my God, there are so many, so many tabs and sub menus here in this that sometimes it's really hard to find something that you need. So it's probably a line and snap. No, it's not. It's cut and sew. And there's sew and stitch together. The difference is when I click sew, uh, nothing gets moved. Uh, things are just yeah sewn together. Soon sewn. They're stitched together. And when I say stitch together, um, those individual pieces are moved to where it makes the most sense. Now I have here, of course, the problem that um, these parts here, they don't line up too well. But with those here, th those I can just... Uh, suit together and it's okay I think but we, we you get uh, weird transformations and and yeah stuff that doesn't look as neat as as it could so this was um, this part here so let's uh, check it out how it looks if it's mapped and if yeah you can see already it looks it looks what's happening here on this polygon here is a little bit weird um, because there, there, there is this transition going on between this part and the one here on top. So, so is pronounced so. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, German. So I'm sewing it together. Yeah, my English is so so. Okay, so this doesn't this doesn't work at least for this in sorry for this individual plane or face here. My guess is that actually it's the same problem here, but it's not a problem at all because we can say that this face is actually part of this arch here. Same thing on the other side. So I just select uh, what I had here. Those, let me turn it off, those problematic faces and then uh, this add here the rest of this arch and then map this automatically again. So everything is now part of this and without the weird stretching artifacts. Wonderful. And this one here on the bottom, again, uh, you won't probably be seeing this because it's uh, for the most part occluded by those bricks. So it's just the plaster that's between the bricks. So we don't really uh, need a lot of uh, yeah, texture space for this. So this uh, we can actually shrink down and just position anywhere. So yeah, I take this arch here and just scale it down proportionally so that it's here in the middle. Um, this looks good. Yeah, maybe maybe to the side. And like I said, this one here is not that important, so I can just scale it down somewhere like here. Like I said, because you, you won't be seeing much of it, so this can just be a couple of very muddy pixels. And yeah, we don't we don't care. And those parts here are, are the parts uh, of the window. You can see here, um, yeah, those uh, uh, yeah framings of the window and window frames probably. <laughs> and those are used. Uh, I can put also here inside in this middle hole that we have. I just need to rotate it. How to rotate it? There, yeah, transform, and boink. Now it works apart from again this arched bit here but maybe I can put this here on top where we conveniently already have an arch here so I can scale it up and 
devote much more texture space to it than I could otherwise. Yeah, with all curved things, it's always a bit uh, tricky to, to place them correctly. But now, um, since I scaled them down pretty, pretty severely that they fit in the place that I had them before, right now it's, I can, you know, I can scale them up again and yeah, just gift them the beautiful gift of more texture space, essentially. So, yeah, this looks good. Uh, the only thing is now that the plaster bit there is completely uh, uh, used up there. But uh, you know what? I can I can put it also on top here because there's still some room and I don't need a lot of room for it. Like I said, it's just it's just something that it is mapped to some pixels, but it's not really that important. And now those parts can even occlude more pixels in the texture. This is wonderful. This is a very tightly packed um, texture map, but of course you can see it only uses roughly half of my uh, texture space. It's This is one here is the, the gray line here is at 0.5. So this is exactly the half and it extends a bit bigger than the half of it which is okay because again uh, I've mentioned yeah in, in the beginning that I don't like to see re repet repetitiveness or repeating texture patterns and so I will use one map that will be used for two of those uh, segments there so I will just copy this over and place it next to each other so I have a yeah essentially I can use two maps for this but what I completely forgot now is of course we I want to have my bricks there in the same uh, text UV space and if I add them here you can see now they don't really seem to be part of it because now they are occluded of course by this small bit. But since I need to scale it down anyway just a little bit to have it fit here in this uh, 0 to, uh, to 0.5 space here and just scale it down ever so slightly and since I'm scaling it proportionally there's now uh, I think enough room I hope let's knock on wood for um, all the bricks because what I won't be uh, uh, texturing where I think it's okay if a texture repeats is on these bricks here on the second part of it. Oh, what I completely forgot now is, of course, here this this back side. Again, I don't really need to have it textured since it's just used for um, shadow mapping. But again, it's good to have it somewhere here in your texture space. So this can only this doesn't even have to be a pixel. It just needs to be somewhere in there where it's not yeah occluding something else or causing problems because of that. Okay, so you know what, let's save this again under a new version and I will delete again all my history of the things that I just did. <laughs> uh, some people, it would be wonderful if you could uh, just, for some people it would be great if you just could delete their history whenever you needed to. So uh, let's uh, say modify and center pivot. And now we'll duplicate this thing there so that I can just yeah copy over the map. So what we got here, you can see in my texture space, we got a couple of things here going on. For one thing is the window pane is really a pain because it is now um, overlapping everything. But for now, I think this is not too much of a problem because this will go on, an, on a texture by itself. So I leave the window pane alone. The problem only with the window pane is that um, the window frames are part of actually the other texture map. So I move it to this wall segment and also there move uh, this into all the bricks into this wall segment group and so far it looks good but I think the, the lower bricks are still a bit too big for now but maybe I mean those lower bricks, maybe I can get away with if they don't use up as much texture space, or maybe maybe the upper, maybe the upper bricks don't get as much texture space. Again, it's 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 like <laughs> when you're in graphics design for those of you who are, and uh, you have a client and uh, you're doing just a one-page advertising, and the client, of course, they want their logo to be big. So you make the logo really big, but then your client says, yeah, but the 
product is also important, the product name. So yeah, okay, you make the product name also bigger, but then it looks crappy. And then your client says, yeah, but it's also very important that this other thing is big. And in the end, uh, if it yeah, if, if it goes <laughs> uh, how the client wishes to, everything is big because everything is important. But again, you want an airy elegance of the design. And this is essentially, it's, it's what you want to do with UVs. Pretty much everything you want to give as much UV space as you can, <laughs> because everything is important. And this is just what I'm trying to do here now, playing again, bit of, of uh, UV mapping Tetris. So, uh, yeah, maybe. But the problem is the more you move around in the UV map, the harder it is to in, in, in the Photoshop stage where you apply, yeah, you map photos <laughs> to it. Um, yeah, it's, it's really hard uh, in that case to keep track of where something belongs because, yeah, all those bricks are on this row, but uh, there are others that need to go on a different, uh, are placed differently in the UV layout and so on and so forth. So I will try to see how far I can get when those things there are pretty cramped up here. But yeah, we will, we will, we will see how it goes. Okay, so this is number one. This is here the back side of everything. So I can squish it also here on top. Like I said, it's not really important where it is in the map, just that it doesn't occlude anything else because when I'm baking the occlusion, that it doesn't yeah, override something that I actually want to keep. Then I can see here those edges there are overlapping, which is not so good, but it's just, it's very, it's just very small, so can just move this UV up a little bit and it's okay if it's uh, if I call it it causes a little bit of deformation which you probably won't notice so I think I'm fine I'm fine with that uh, one last thing here that I forgot to uh, texture is this part here uh, why is this important well when you uh, copy and paste it over um, this uh, column here in in the center here you will also see it not only from this side but also from the other side and this I completely forgot to map so yeah we should do this and did I map it from this side no I also forgot to map it from from this side so again we we should be doing this and yeah it's uh, okay I have to select it by hand here because uh, I, I tempered so much with this uh, mesh here that um, Maya when I double click it usually uh, uh, Maya knows that I mean yeah this row or this loop of faces or edges but now I since uh, yeah like I said I've tempered so much with it that Maya is not quite sure which belongs to which and then just selects everything so again I do the same thing here and say automatic mapping just so that I don't have to manually set my uh, plane there. Automatic mapping, there we go. And now I try, um, yeah, one, one we can stitch together here, stitch together. And the other one um, I place right next to it. But um, yeah, this is on the inside, of course. But it should, if it has the right uh, exact same height, I think it should line up nicely when I'm adding now then the bricks in terms of the actual, uh, yeah, photo mapping. So, and just to be super, super uh, uh, thorough, I line up here the UVs, um, just that they are really snapped together in the exact same place. It's a bit hard to see, so essentially what I'm doing is, is this here. Oh my god, I shouldn't do this when I'm zoomed in. Um, it's just to make sure that, yeah, all those uh, UVs there are on the exact same, same level as the one that are already here in the connected model. Since it's only a couple of edges, it's, it's, it's all right. I, I can do this without, without cursing too much. There we go, last one. So this is, yeah, wonderfully, wonderfully mapped, 
I'm, I'm quite happy with this. Okay, again, I have to scale this entire thing down here again, just a little bit so that this part here uh, doesn't uh, overlap with the other side, then transform pivot. There we go. Scale it down just a little bit and look at this. Now I got some more breathing room for the bricks on top. So, um, you know what? Those need more space than these here. So these I can put on this side and they go up here and I can scale them up. It's always nice when you find an opportunity to scale something up again in the UV map. Okay, I get an overlap here on the right side. So I'll move this to the left. Can I scale it up even a bit further? Probably not, but yeah, it's yeah, it's 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 all right. It works. It's fine. No, oh, forgot this one. Okay, so on top are our bricks. Now I can, you know what, now I can even scale up those bricks a little bit like this. So this works fine for me now. And now I can uh, duplicate this and just, yeah, copy it over uh, to be used on the other side then. Save this. <laughs> and yeah, now I'm, I'm trying to duplicate pretty much the entire group there and move it to this side here. Yeah, and this is how it, it should tile tile up. And now I can see here one problem that I have is apparently this thing here, I'm not quite sure what happened here, but I moved in some instance of editing, <laughs> I moved uh, uh, this entire edge a bit too far inwards. So this I need to fix. Okay, now it works here. And of course, I need to do this also <laughs> on, on this model here, edge. Because this, you know what, I, I delete. No, no, I won't delete this now. I'm just move it into position that it's it snaps. Does it snap? Does it look right? Yeah, it's weird. I still got a little hole there. This is... <laughs> this is weird. I, I don't know how this happened when I was uh, uh, modeling it, but apparently there is a hole, but uh, not on top. So when I was doing this wall there, apparently I messed things up. Okay, um, plan B. I delete now here my uh, second instance of everything and say I can duplicate the entire group uh, as an instance, which means when I'm moving on one uh, one version, it updates on all the other instances. Shark says, I'm gonna head out, uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for dropping by and enjoy your day as well. And thanks for looking up the thing on Reddit. This really helps me a lot now. <laughs> okay, see you. Um, okay, so um, let's find modify. No, this was, yes, it was modified. Duplicate special, it was not modified, it was, Edit, duplicate, special. And there I can say I want an instance. Um, I want two instances that are, let's say, three meters apart. And let's say instance and apply. So apparently, yeah, not in the Y axis, but all along the X axis. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this looks better. So and now, like I said, when I'm... Uh, when I'm editing one group, uh, all the other groups automatically update. And this is good exactly for things like tiling layouts and so on. So um, just plop this here. So yeah, now when, when I select something on one object, it's also selected on the instances. And now this makes it possible for me to, to really uh, uh, yeah, fix, fix this alignment issue here. So I'm just uh, grabbing all those vertices that are problematic and snap them to where the other instance ends and to make this really waterproof. Yeah, I don't know what happened. It's probably also uh, in other portions of uh, the model, but so far, yeah, I only care about where it's really problematic that you can see it. 
But then again, it's also nice if it's, uh, I mean, it, it's much more realistic, of course, if it's not 100% correct in every way or, yeah, it's, maybe I should also do this here on um, the shadow mesh, essentially, yeah. I don't know what happened here, really. Oh, it's my wife, probably she's telling me that she's going to bed, so I think I will just finish with this side here and then call it a day. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, we didn't get to do much modeling, uh, not much texturing, right? It's just just trying to figure out how to, how to map something nicely. But, yeah, again, it's, it's really weird what... Uh, horrific uh, uh, accidents I had here on this mesh, but it hey, it's, it's good that we're fixing it right now and not uh, that uh, it's, it's not that you realize it when it's much too late when it's already in the game and you have to go through your entire uh, workflow to get it fixed again so uh, yeah For some reason yeah, it's it's not it's not too good, but I think I think it it should work for now. Okay, so yeah, this was it uh, for me. Apparently, all we did was finish here the mesh and do the mapping. But again, let's review uh, our UV map for this thing here. Um, I'm pretty happy with it, uh, with how the bricks worked out in the end. Here is the group that we got all the bricks here. And then, of course, we can, I just, use the entire UV map that we had for this uh, uh, wall segment and then copy it over to the other. And then I got one big texture where no repeating uh, uh, bricks or repeating patterns should emerge. Well, unless of course you have two of those uh, double <laughs> windows uh, next to each other. But yeah, that's a different problem. At least it's not something that I need to solve in this scene that I have here in Unity because it's not that big. But maybe I will need it again for another scene, who knows, and what I will do there. Maybe I will say just screw this, it's okay if it looks a little bit repetitive. Hey, I'm just I'm just one person, so. <laughs> okay, so um, I don't think I have any viewers right now, I haven't looked actually, but since Sharks Interactive left, um, actually it's five viewers. Oh, thank you so much for following my boring uh, talk about yeah I want to do some shading and texturing and this is all we got but uh, yeah either way let me switch back to uh, the big camera I hope this was a little bit interesting sorry that we didn't get this far because I spent way too much time trying to fix my bricks <laughs> Uh, but I, yeah, I hope uh, you've learned some, uh, something because I did. And either way, I hope you have a great week. I know that I will. And hopefully next week I can show you much more progress and see how this thing finally turned out in the end. So uh, with uh, that being said, um, unicorn, be sure to drink some more water because it's hot, it's summer, at least where I am. So it's dehydration is really a thing. Ah. Cool. And let me find uh, the right slide there on OBS. So yeah, if you have any questions or comments or how you do things, please let me know and put those in the comments because this video will go up in 24 hours on my YouTube channel. That is a fill motion video where all my streams are archived there. So uh, yeah, if you wrote something in the chat and you want to have your friends see that you wrote something to me in the chat, you can send them over to my other video. This, this is not how it works, is it? <laughs> anyway, hey, thank you so much for watching. Have a great week and see you next week. Um, and where's my button that I want to push? See you next week. And until then, have a great time. So long.